שנה טובה. In his essay, The Postman Rings a Thousand Times, journalist Gabriel Garcia Marquez describes his visit to what he calls the Cemetery of Lost Letters. The year is 1954, we're in Colombia, and Marquez is describing the place designated for letters that never reach their destination. Of course, this is very different from the situation with our U.S. Postal Service today. Marquez writes, change of address of both sender and receiver, although it seems far-fetched, is the simplest and most frequent reason for letters to arrive at the Office of Unclaimed Letters. After months of efforts, these messages will be sent to 567 Carrera Octavia, single-story house, with a low roof and peeling walls where nobody seems to live. Six methodical, scrupulous civil servants covered by the rust of routine will do everything possible to find clues that might still help them complete the delivery. But he continues, not all packages found at the lost letters office have the wrong address. Many of them have simply been refused by their intended recipients. They won't open the door to the messenger. They're indifferent from the telephone calls from Senor Posada Ucros, who looks up the addressee's number in the phone book and implores them. Ucros, the messenger, is accustomed to these sorts of incidents and resorts to all kinds of cunning ruses to get the addressee to receive the letter. In most cases, though, all efforts are futile. There are three kinds of denial, each one described in Artara. First kind of denial is bold and unabashed. Rather than present a counterargument, this denial refuses to acknowledge a given problem in the first place. Residents of Sodom and Gomorrah, and when I talk about this text, I always want to clarify that in the comments of our rabbis, the Averas, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah had nothing to do with sexual preference, but were rather based in extreme selfishness. There's a moment when God, based on that selfishness, is about to destroy the city. Lot, who understands what's about to happen, is trying to clear out with his whole family. He runs to his sons-in-law to deliver the message. They all have to leave town immediately. But in the eyes of his sons-in-law, Lot was like someone making a joke. And Targum Jonathan just tr translates it this way. To the sons-in-law, Lot was like a raving lunatic. You see, in that place, there was such an ingrained pattern of forbidding outsiders to the point where abuse of visitors was commonplace, an abuse that was carried out in the marketplace and validated in the courts. There was such an ingrained culture of mistrust and selfishness that the act of hosting an outsider was like putting a target on your back. That simple act of hospitality, of breaking the rules of selfishness, made you vulnerable to the rage of the community. That's the kind of place it was. This helps us understand why Lot's sons-in-law could not even take him seriously. Why his warning was to them, you'll forgive me, fake news why they did not even engage with his fear. They couldn't, for if they admitted he might be right, their whole world view would fall completely apart. They might have to admit that their selfishness was the reason for God's anger. So they didn't even ask him, where did you hear it? Are, are you sure? They just said, are you kidding? Have you seen the stock prices? We've never been better. This is the first kind of denial a complete and utter inability to engage with reality around us. The second kind of denial is in the story of Noah. 
Noah is told you might have heard to build an ark because the world has become corrupt and violent and again God is going to destroy the world. What can I tell you? Torah is not for the faint of heart. But the rabbis, always wanting to show God's good side, explained that the generations before the flood were sent messages. They were warned to change for 120 years. Then Noah planted cedar trees to get ready to make the ark. And the whole time the trees were growing, Noah is still trying to tell the people the message. Then Noah built that whole ark all by himself. It took a while, repeating the message. None, none of those years, at none of those times, did they listen. What could create that kind of denial? The rabbis have an idea. They suggest that God had given the generation of the flood every blessing, safety, prosperity, peace. And ironically, that success is what caused them to say to God, get away from us. We have everything. What could we possibly get from you? Do we need you for anything? Even rain? We already have rivers. We got plenty of water. See, the denial of the generation of the flood was based in prosperity. It was the powerful denial of ego. Who needs God when you believe you can make up the code for water? Who needs God or the cumbersome baggage of moral responsibility when you kind of already sort of feel like God? The third and last kind of denial comes from the story of Jonah. Jonah, as you remember, is a prophet who does not want to hear a message from God, let alone go and deliver it. So God, in the very beginning of the story, says to Jonah, Kumlech, get up, go to Nineveh, deliver my message. And Jonah, in response, right away, next verse, Vayakam Yonah, same word. He gets up, but then Livroch Tarshisha, Melifne Adonai, he runs. He flees from God. In fact, Jonah runs with so much commitment and enthusiasm that Rashi comments, when Jonah finds a ship that's going away from where God wants him to go, Jonah pays for the fare for the whole boat. In other words, Jonah doesn't run from receiving or giving his message because his worldview won't allow him to take in disturbing information, like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he doesn't run because he thinks he's so powerful, like the generation of the flood. Jonah runs because he knows the message is true. See, denial number three is a different kind. It's when we know we have a role to play. We know we're supposed to open the letter, go to the place. We're just really scared. And so we board the first ship we can find. Further away, the better. Not because we don't know what to do, but because we do. This year, there is a message for us. I saw it written in the black sky. This Rosh Hashanah, things are terribly out of balance. And maybe you saw it too. And this is not the first time this message was sent to us. Not by far. Many people have tried to tell us about the natural world, our complicity in its destruction. Sometimes we listened. We watched an important film, maybe. Thought about the glaciers melting, species ending, forests dying, oceans warming, coral reefs disappearing, hurricanes raging, fires enveloping, water rising, to name a few examples. And then, with some exceptions, pretty much went back to doing what we had always done. And if you are one of the tzaddikim who has been making real efforts toward environmental change, thank you. You have the day off. But for the rest of us, the messages sent our way, more or less, remained unopened. Perhaps it was all too heartbreaking to believe. So we were like the people of Gomorrah, 
saying to the messengers, don't be so extreme. Everything's good. It's all good. Or it's possible because the scope of the problems were truly impossible to fathom that we simply couldn't hold everything in our minds. We had what Jonathan Safran Foer calls a fatigue of the imagination. Whatever combination of fear, denial, and human frailty got us here, now the messages are unavoidable. They wait for us, one piling on top of another. The most recent one actually turning day to night. I could list all the statistics like usual, but now we're living them. Now we don't need a prophet to tell us. Any window will do. Even Jonah eventually learned, there's only so far you can run. When Rabbi Iger returned from Kotsk, his father asked him, what did you learn? Rabbi Iger answered the first phrase in Torah, Breshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. In Kotsk we learned this means God only created the beginning and left the rest to us. In the days of Torah, God would send the messages. Things are different now. Now the messages also come from us. In other words, the black skies last week were a message that we accumulatively, incrementally, consistently sent to ourselves through our choices over the last decades. In the beginning, of in, the, in the words of the Kotzker, God only created the beginning. The rest was left to us. In the old days, the rain was a sign, a message from God. And if the rain did not come, the community would assume there has to be a problem, must have done something to displease heaven. And we would pray for mercy, pray for the rain to fall. And sometimes we would fast to gain God's favor there could be up to 13 fasts. In the old days, the rain or its absence was a sign, a message from God. Today, it seems the lack of rain is also a sign, a sign we've sent to ourselves. And I was thinking about the old system, us needing the rain and praying and fasting and God hopefully listening and sending the rain. And while the climate is now a responsibility resting largely in our hands, Perhaps there are still pieces of the old system we would do well to recover. First, you'll notice in this ancient system, our actions are directly connected to the fall of rain. Let me say it again. Our actions are directly connected to the fall of rain. After all, when our fathers and mothers used to pray and fast for the rain, they weren't abdicating responsibility. They weren't running. They believed, as some of us believe even today, that talking to God matters. That articulating pain in private and the acknowledgement of communal problems in public is a decent start. Second, there's practically a whole masechet on this in Talmud. Our ancestors did not only pray and fast to bring the rain. They assumed no rain meant there was some other kind of corruption in the community. To be more specific, they assumed environmental problems were evidence of local stealing or violence that they then ventured to expose. Prayer was a big part of the solution, but it was their understanding that it was these corruptions, these root causes that stopped the rain. What if we carried the same conviction that our actions, even the ones we don't categorize as environmental, what if we held the same conviction that the way we act in the world had a direct impact on the skies? And there's more. If the praying or fasting didn't work, our leaders would insist that people decrease their business. You want disruption? Disruption is not finding a new planet when we've destroyed this one. Disruption is checking greed at the door. Now that is a radical idea. A little less business, Talmud says, specifically less construction. It wasn't that hard for our ancestors thousands of years ago to articulate, yet it is strangely foreign to us. Hold off on building projects you don't really need, Talmud says. And by the way, this specifically, they detail it out. It doesn't include building homes for people who need homes. 
But if the skies are closed, try holding off on the building projects for vanity and ego. Try imagining that your project does not supersede God's world. See where I'm going here? For anyone who says that ideas with political implications and trajectories do not belong in shul, for our rabbis, even the rain was political. And it doesn't end there. If the rain stopped and the skies closed, and I swear I'm not making this up, the leaders would search for the smallest of moral infractions to see if anyone had engaged in using words to hurt one another. Specifically, they would see if there had been any false boasting. Perhaps a person claiming he has given charity in public and then breaking that promise, I'm not making this up. They have many more ideas about what closes the skies, each one built on the assumption that what we do in all aspects of our lives matters. But my personal favorite is uncollected taxes. Okay, they may have been talking about ties to the temple, but I think this easily, this idea can easily and must be expanded. In other words, if communal organizations the structures and laws by which we and people, our community is cared for in all kinds of ways. If there's no enforced system for taking care of the larger community, for prioritizing our civic and moral and spiritual health, for guarding the rights of the many, for guarding the vulnerable, no rain. I don't know, but it sure sounds like the rabbis of the Talmud were advocating for the Green New Deal as if the rabbis understood that what we consider to be the economic situation and the environmental situation and the spiritual situation was actually all one situation. Who takes a drought, the anguish of thirst and a lack of livelihood and uses it as a springboard towards social equity and justice? Who? when they are at their most tired and most weak, insists on exploring the root causes of the lack of rain in order to address them? Who reads all the unopened messages we've sent to ourselves and instead of running, finds a way to respond in civic structures and religious rituals and legal systems? The rabbis do. That's the rabbinic project. That's what the rabbis were trying to do. And that, my friends, is what the great Sadiq Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, may her memory be a blessing, that's what she worked her whole life to do. And that, as hard as it is, my friends, that's what we're going to do now too. There's a story of an actual rainmaker, a man, Honi, who when things got really bad, would stand in a circle and shout and demand rain from God. Now, I definitely love the fact that he would carry on and yell at God and raise a lot of awareness and risk his reputation and, let's face it, put his life on the line for the community. But to be perfectly honest, I need to say this. My favorite part about the Honey stories is that there are so many. As if to remind us, even if the most famous rainmakers don't change things permanently. I'll say it again, even the most famous rainmakers don't change things permanently. Because invariably, society tumbles off its path and another drought comes along. In other words, the project of keeping rain going, of maintaining our overall spiritual, economic, environmental, communal health, it doesn't end famous rainmaker around or not. In any case, the story I need to tell you doesn't even involve Honey. It involves his daughter-in-law. I'm sad to say her name has not been saved for us, but since her husband, Honey's son, is referred to as Abba, father in Hebrew, I'm calling her Ima. It means mother, and while it's not the most original name, it's something. In any case, some visitors come visit Abba and Ima to ask for rain. They believe the rainmaker thing runs in the family, see? And long story short, because Abba and Ima are sort of magic, even before the guests have a chance to ask them to help, Abba and Ima mysteriously go up to their roof and immediately the rains come. And it turns out, and the visitors witness this, 
The clouds gather on Ema's side of the roof. She brings the rain. After witnessing the whole phenomenon, the visitors ask Abba, why did the rain clouds gather on Ema's side of the roof? After all, she's not even related by blood to Honey the famous rainmaker. And Abba answers saying, it might be because once, when there were some Biryone, some hoodlums, rebels, gangs in the neighborhood, I, Abba, prayed they would die. But Ima prayed they would make tshuva, that they would turn and repent, change. And indeed, he says, it happened. The people made tshuva and they restored themselves. So you see here, in addition to being a barometer of social health and a reflection of economic equity, rain follows the possibility of tshuva, of forgiveness and return. Public, private, it doesn't matter. What matters is the generosity, the long game. In other words, you could be the son of Honey, the famous rainmaker, but there is no rain without forgiveness. I spoke with Nigel Savage of Hazan and asked him about the messages we've been sending ourselves, the messages we seem unable to read without running away. And he said something that stuck with me. He said, if we're gonna come through this, we're gonna need to name the guilt and come out the other side. We know tshuva. We know turning requires us to name what we've done wrong. Maybe if we name the lost time the ignored messages, the denial. Maybe if we can imagine the edge of forgiveness, we can start to find our way to the other side. Of course, confessions alone will not be sufficient. We can read all the messages in the sky. We can beat our chests and cry wearing sackcloth and ashes. I hear there's plenty of ash available. <clears throat> we can virtue signal from now until Greta's 120th birthday. But if we do not also engage in restitution and action, we'll only recreate another version of Jonah's running. And it turns out committing to action is not so bad because we're Jews, we're people who do Jewish. We know all about keeping laws. We know all about the fleeting nature of intent, even the best intent when compared to good old commitment. So now as part of our tshuva, along with our seeking to be righteous in our taxes and speech, we will keep new holy laws, new mitzvot, the details of which are still being worked out because I'm making them up. Like many fluid times in history, there are many new laws now vying for codification. So I won't promise these are the only contenders, but we need to start somewhere. So I, so I suggest starting in 5781, Four things. Number one, we will limit or refrain from driving. Number two, we will limit or refrain from flying. Number three, we will make concrete steps toward eating a plant-based diet. Number four, we will vote. And we will vote our consciences and do what we can to get out the vote in order to ensure this conversation about the rain and the sky is etched in our legal codes and our budgets and reflected in our national priorities. We know these new mitzvot, these commandments alone will not fix what we've done. But we know that if we practice them with commitment, these rituals will be a constant reminder to us that we're engaged in a process of tshuva of turning, that we want the rains to come again, that the new world can look different than the one we're just leaving now. And just like Kitchenites have begun an anti-racism cohort and formed lasting relationship with members of the Glide community, I'd like us to convene a group who prioritizes environmental commitments, a cohort who forges partnerships and helps us understand the work ahead. Nigel reminded me that five days after the installation of our new president, please God, which would mean the beginning of the Green New Deal, please God, five days after that installation is the holiday of Tubishvat, the holiday of the trees. He said to me, this year let's move beyond happy trees and eating fruit and nuts. 
This year, let's consider Tu B'Shvat as the start of the rest of our lives. He suggested we create a team who takes time from Tu B'Shvat to next Rosh Hashanah to convene and create a real plan with the promise that next Rosh Hashanah, we will present that plan and commit publicly to being part of a larger solution. I suggest this group call itself the Rainmakers, but if you show up, you can call it whatever you want, and I am in your hands. In a very common prayer, you may have said it without realizing it. There's a strange, even controversial phrase. With great mercy, God, you give life to the dead. You could see why it causes a stir. But we read it metaphorically, as in reviving a relationship that has died, reviving an agreement, reviving trust, that kind of thing. When these things happen, we say, thank God, something has been brought back to life. But this Rosh Hashanah, what stopped me in my tracks is I remembered that we make a blessing with just this phrase when we see someone we have not seen face to face for more than a year. In other words, this is the one prayer we'd all better learn because now it dawns on us. Now we realize just how many faces we have not seen and just how much we will need to bring back to life. In fact, now we realize we will need to resurrect a great many things. And this phrase that at first seems so strange may in fact be the very prayer of our hour. We realize now we must do nothing less than bringing ourselves and our world back to life. I don't blame anyone for being frightened, for checking the proverbial sh ship schedule to see when the next boat is leaving town. But before you go, I only ask that you also notice a line in that same prayer. You could call it a message, only this time it is from the rabbis to us. Because out of all the prayers they could have chosen from, it's right there, right in our prayer, about bringing things back to life, that the rabbis also added the prayer for rain. As if they were saying, as if they wanted to tell us, you want to bring your depleted world back to life? You want justice and leaves on the trees and forgiveness? It's still possible. Just trust us. It all starts with the rain. Follow the rain. Do whatever it takes to bring it back.